I recently had a conversation with young Earth creationist Sal Cordova about genetic entropy. This video was going to be streamed live, but it didn't actually work out, uh, the streaming part, because the audio quality was not so great. So I decided to take the video, chop it down a bit, and I'm going to break this down into several different parts. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about creationist genetics today. And this is also an opportunity for me to practice my Adobe Premiere Pro skills. So we're going to take it from the part where Sal describes a little bit of creationist genetics. So let's get started. Indirectly. So, I'm kind of curious how genetic entropy fits into like the bigger creationist model, right? So if the earth is 6,000 years old and humanity is 6,000 years old, I suppose that means that if we have the steady accumulation of mutations that Sanford seems to highlight, well, then, and, and it's only going to accumulate more and more is basically the model that the, and, and you've stated multiple times that humanity is declining, that we have, I, I you cited a few different lines of evidence, like, I don't know, did you say something about decline in IQ or that our brains are smaller than they used to be, which is true, right? There's yeah. some evidence that that's yes. the case. When you look in the fossil record, there does appear to be a decline in brain size um, in humans on the order of around 10%. Although some of that data has recently been challenged, um, but I still think that some of that is compelling. Um, uh, but you're saying that those are evidences of this decay, right? Yeah, yes. So, so, so we had Adam and Eve, and all humanity is descended from Adam and Eve. But then, of course, we had another bottleneck with the flood, where Noah and his descendants were the second bottleneck. That was around 4,000 years ago or so. So I wanted to interject a little just to clarify what I'm trying to say. We have all of humanity descending from Adam and Eve, right? They're in the Garden of Eden. They had some kids, Cain and Abel. We all know Cain and Abel were uh, the famous story of Cain killing Abel. And so obviously Abel had no kids. Adam and Eve also had another son named Seth. And all of humanity is descended from Seth. And that's because Seth's lineage leads to Noah. So let's go down that lineage a little bit. We have... You know, a number of people described in the Bible, such as Methuselah. So here's a picture of Methuselah. Um, you know, this is a stained glass image from someplace, probably in Europe. I don't know. Anyway, so Methuselah, what he's famous for is being the oldest person described in the Bible. He was 969 years old. And um, so, you know, he was also Noah's grandfather, which is pretty cool. And of course, I say we have a second bottleneck because there was the great flood. God decided to kill all of humanity. He felt that they were not obeying his laws, so therefore everyone had to be killed. Noah and his family were the sole survivors. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japhet. They had wives. Noah, of course, had his wife. And all eight of them were the only people that survived the Great Flood 4,000 years ago, according to creationists. Therefore, that means all of humanity is descended from these three people, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and then their wives. So we have another bottleneck, another genetic bottleneck. We only have so much genetic variability that we could derive from Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so presumably genetic entropy means that that's part of why we have the variability that we have today. Where Noah and his descendants were the second bottleneck. That was around 4,000 years ago or so. I actually don't know. I'm not really anal as like other creationists about timelines and chronology. But it's critical, isn't it? Because like if, if there's a like a rate of mutation, because like the way we develop phylogenetics is that there's kind of an assumed rate of mutation <clears throat> and that mutations steadily accumulate because that's part of that's part of what we're talking about, right? Mutations accumulate in the genome, and we can use that rate of mutation to make inferences of when there was a last common ancestor between different species. I think one reason I'm not that anal is um, the, we we do know that there are hot spots in the genome, and there's there's yeah. variability within within some, the mutation rates. Right, there's some 
there's generally going to be mutations that we can observe when you compare closely related species, for instance. I mean, there's just a general rate of mutation based on generation time uh, that we can observe, right? If And because and what's passed between generations is the genes. And so if, an, if a given species has a generation time of one year, well, then like the rate that uh, mutations accumulate is going to be faster than it is in humans, which is on the order of 25 years or so, right? Um, if I, if I'm sorry to interrupt, that um, yeah. uh, there has been concern that the molecular clocks may actually even be different for different ethnicities. Um, I haven't heard that, and that this is a testable prediction being made by creationists, but we've observed it. Um, uh, so you're saying the rate of mutation may differ between. Well, well, I'll tell you why, because the mm -hmm. the DNA repair mechanisms, if those genes are knocked out in one lineage, the mutation rate is going to be higher. Sure. And, yeah. and so uh, that's Are there one, human beings that have no DNA repair? It may be compromised in that. And I'm just saying that's not, that's within the realm of possibility for any lineage of creatures, not just human beings, that if there's compromise in their DNA repair mechanisms, they may have higher mutation rates. And we also do sure. know in bacteria, sure under stress conditions, they can actually accelerate their mutation rates. It's right. kind of a last resort defense. So um, that's why I'm saying I'm not anal about trying to use those as clocks. It, it mm -hmm. might generally say that uh, we might have kind of bigger error bars. Right. So we'll have a mean and then a kind of really big error bar. But you know, to try to narrow it down within like a few thousand years, I'm sure. like- I, Well, I, have, I mean, I right, if the model is that the earth is only 6,000 years old and there was Adam and Eve at the start. So actually I'd kind of like to talk about that a little bit. So sure. um, Eve was made from Adam's rib is what you believe, right? She yes. Creationists believe that Eve was created from Adam's rib. This is a fresco depicting this biological technological event. The guy on the left, I presume that that's, God, I, I, I don't know. He kind of looks like Jesus, but I guess this is God. Um, I also don't understand why he's missing a finger, but okay. Um, but anyway, what the point is, is that this is illustrating how Eve just sort of sprang forth from Adam's rib. This is some, this was, this is what creationists believe that Eve was formed and fashioned out of Adam's rib. They don't go into the details of how this occurred, but obviously draws up a bunch of different questions, you know, like, you know, if you have just one rib, how do you make a whole person from that uh, one rib? Also, the other thing is that, of course, is that, a man, you know, Adam is a man. Presumably, he has 23 pairs of chromosomes, including an XY chromosome set. And then you have the rib uh, that then ha is has male tissue male chromosomes but this is then turned into a female which has xx i suppose the fact that that uh that adam has xy that i i guess what would have happened is that if this is jesus here jesus you know sat down and made sure that every cell had a duplicated x chromosome but what we're going to hear from sal is an explanation of how we get heterogeneity in the chromosomes because if you're starting with just two sets of chromosomes where does all the variability come from how how did that work because i mean i guess adam he had an x and a y chromosome and then eve would have xx what how what was the process in generating a female to emerge out of his rib do you have any sense of what the mechanical process was of that i think it's something outside of our uh will be forever outside of our accessibility of physics and chemistry. Why? Why do you and, why do you say that? Because like we could potentially do those things, don't you think? Uh, it was done in in a day, at least if you kind of read it literally like I do. Okay. And so we could not clone it and, and grow it. And plus where would the is the word gestate? I'm not a developmental biologist. What mm -hmm. happens to the embryo inside the yeah, embryo needs to, to gestate, that's right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um that would take nine months at least or whatever, but this happened in a day. Yeah, maybe those details weren't necessarily included. So um, I so would you're say- you're saying that that was, I'm just kind of confused because it's like, 
Is that a physical mechanism or is this non-physical? Not non-physical. And so, not, not how did, and so in a physical world, we had this non-physical event occur where Adam's rib was plucked from his body and was mm -hmm. converted into a, a whole female human being. Right. And it would be a lesser process than creating a whole human being all at once. And, and, and so, um, because I guess you're starting with some biological material or no, Adam was created from dust from, right. It's yeah, that's right. That's non living awesome. matter assembled into there. And, but then Eve sprang forth from his rib, right? right? And so, so, so then obviously the designer in this case made the decision of like, okay, well, what I'll do is I'm going to replicate the X chromosome so that you have two of them, right? Because we know that well, women have two X chromosomes. Well, and, there but would, then I, I guess that does, does to, that mean that the, add some, he would have to add some extra things like dosage compensation for the X because the X chromosome in women is actually suppressed. One of them. Sure. Right. There are mechanisms of dosage compensation. Right. Yeah. I mean, some genes are, are generally expressed in both chromosomes um, and, and you get, you know, more or less equal amount. And then that also leads to some of the differences between, you know, uh, female biology and male biology that you only get right. half of the, uh, of the expression from uh, in men versus women. But I guess then does that mean the other 22 chromosomes were identical to uh, Adam? Uh, the creationist model is no. Uh, so the, the, how, created, how are those it created heterozygosity. That's the current model being promoted by Dr. Sanford, Nathaniel Jensen, Rob Carter. So we don't know that it's right. There was this duplication of the X chromosomes. But then addition and then, of the and then the other chromosomes were also modified by the designer at that point. Yes, that's the to current model. Heterozygosity. So okay, yeah. so then we'll, we'll with those that. Two individuals, we have four chromosomes for every pair of chromosomes that we have, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So and that's six thousand years ago. And so then yeah. every other variation that we've had since then has to be derived from those four chromosomes that were originally uh, set about by the creator? Uh, no, uh, there, there's definitely mutational stuff that's added. Who, and, who did that? Uh, that's natural. We predict that that's natural. That's the model. That's oh, okay. the prevailing right. model. Yes, I'm not saying, I mean. so I'm then not saying it's right. Right. But we're putting out, people are putting out their models, and I'm not really involved in that. But mm -hmm. I have to be at least, I'm curious. Let's review Sal's model here. Adam was fashioned from dust into a human being by God. At some point, God plucked Adam's rib from him and the cells in this rib are filled with Adam's chromosomes, including the fact that each chromosome is represented by a single pair of chromosomes. Sal is saying that there were mutations that were added at, maybe at this point in order to have a certain number of alleles. But of course, God also had to turn this DNA into female DNA. So now we have a conversion happening where some of Adam's DNA is being converted over into female DNA. This, of course, includes the fact that he has to make an additional X chromosome. Remember, male chromosomes are going to be XY. And that 23rd pair now needs to be XX. So this rib is now converted over into female DNA, presumably. And at this point, now the rib can then be fashioned, converted, built, somehow poofed into a female. And that female is Eve, now Adam's partner and the grandmother of all of humanity. So this is the model, the creationist model, of how this genetics occurred. As you can see, this does involve, I suppose you might say, some faith statements, since this certainly seems to violate every understanding that we have of biological science. Sure. So, uh, And then we had a bottleneck at Noah's flood, right? right. So, so, so 2000 years passed, a lot of stuff happened, right? Earth became a cursed place and God decided he was going to kill everyone 
except for Noah's family. And then, so everyone was killed, everyone, right? Except for eight people, I believe. Yes. And, and, and also two pairs of every animal or every species. There was kind, like something right? about seven, you know, and I, yeah. I'm a bit, right. I'm glad the, clean animals, the clean animals, it was God said, hey, bring seven of the clean ones. Okay. Right. And then only two, seven pairs, and then only one pair of each other animal. Right. So that also would include... Well, you believe dinosaurs were on the ark? I don't know. I actually Have you given don't. any thought to it? Yeah, I actually don't because they're big. And okay, so, but so are elephants, right? Yeah. So I, I'm and they just obviously like, were on the ark. We have them today. Yeah. So and God said, Noah, you have to take two of every animal, right? See, and I, there are a lot of passages in the Bible where, you know, I think it could be subject to some interpretation. So what you're describing is kind of my personal belief, mm -hmm. which is we have things that we might not be able to verify scientifically. And so I, I do want to make a distinction between kind of like faith claims and maybe any sort of science that we might be able to shed a little light on how to me, credible it is. Like, so what are we left with? Not a whole lot. It looks like most of Sal's descriptions of the genetic events around the origin of humanity, according to his model, as well as what happened around the events of Noah's flood, basically involves what he likes to refer to as faith statements. He also seems very, I would say, hesitant to want to really discuss these issues. So this conversation continued beyond this. Uh, I ended up going into a discussion about what we know about ancient genomes. And um, some of this is actually super interesting. I'm going to be following up with some additional videos on this, but I'm going to end this one right here. So if you like this kind of content, you want to see more of these discussions that I'm having with uh, other scientists. So I've started that series as well, as well as talking with people like Sal and me work working through why their beliefs are, I would say, ludicrous. Um, please like this video, subscribe, and uh, stay tuned for more. Thanks for watching.